Ladies and gentlemen, how are you doing? Right, this is the third episode of Hutton's Consumer Connect webinar series. And thank you very much once again for coming on time. My name is PK So from Hutton's and I'll be your host for tonight. Well, I'm looking at the screen right now and I can see that there are quite a number of attendees still streaming in. Awesome. All right, thank you once again for being here with us, ladies and gentlemen. You know, we really appreciate that you take time out of your precious family time to be with us here tonight, despite the fact that some of you could be Zooming your entire day at work, okay? But let me assure you that, you know, if you stay till the end with us, you will be bringing back so much more insights, specifically with regards to the landed property market in the midst of COVID-19. Okay, now, um, many of you could be stakeholders in this segment. So some of you could be owners of different types of landed properties and uh, could be wondering, you know, how your assets are holding up. Or some of you could be even thinking that, you know, this is the best time to buy, especially during this period of uncertainties and not want to wait till everyone starts coming in. So whichever side of the fence you are at right now, we hope that this session will empower you with the relevant knowledge to take action, okay? So in a short while, I will be inviting our speaker online with us. And to make sure that we keep to our schedule, or maybe plus 15 minutes a little, we'll open up a few questions during the Q&A session towards the end, okay? And um, now in case uh, we don't have the chance to answer some of your questions later on, please always feel free to approach the Cuttons agent who has invited you today to attend this webinar. All right, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you the speaker for tonight, Mr. Willie Ching. All right, so Willie is a multiple award-winning realtor and leader in Cuttons. Um, he has been among the top hundred producers for eight consecutive years and he is also the founder of Hutton's Landed Division which has one of the most uh, prolific social media presence and has transacted more than 100 landed properties in Singapore. All right, it's always good to hear from someone who is always on the ground and the topic that he'll be presenting tonight is impact of COVID-19 on the landed property market. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. Willie Cheung. Over to you, Willie. See me? Sorry. Hi, BK. How uh, are you? How's everyone? Can you see me on the screen? Yes, we can hear you. I uh, can see you well, Willie. See me well as well. Hi, good evening, everyone. I hope all of you have your dinner. I know it's a mad rush, uh, a bit for me as well. Uh, just give me a second. Let me just adjust this. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I want to share with you a, one quick story first, okay? Because yesterday I was trying to invite uh, a lot of my clients to, enter, uh, to join this webinar. And uh, two of them, okay, they called me up quite interestingly. So uh, one of them, both of them, they can't join, all right? They can't join. So uh, what they shared with me, one of them, let's just call him a seller. He's not joining, so I can mention his name, right? So it's Mr. So. Okay, Mr. So, the seller, all right? So he asked me one uh, question, you know, he's, he has a request, uh, Willie, can you just tell them not to uh, rock the price, you know, as a seller? Can you just, in your webinar, just tell everyone not to rock the price, okay? Because he's the seller now. He's afraid that uh, the recent... COVID-19 crisis and what's going to come is going to affect his price. And then yet, uh, a second client of mine, his name is, uh, let me think, buyer, Mr. Big, let's call him Mr. Big, all right? Mr. Big is the buyer. And then uh, one thing, he just said, uh, Willie, can you just help me to ask whether there are fire sale in the market among the panel, among the participants? Does that sound familiar to some of you? I, we, we did a quick poll just now, all right, just to see whether some of you are more of a Mr. Big or more of a Mr. So, okay? So we have now the majority of you are more of a Mr. Big. You're looking actually for a landed property, okay? And less of you are selling, or right? Less of you are selling. Well, Mr. Big, Mr. So, I think I don't blame them. We're all humans, right? I, I think all of us wants a position of the market to be in their favor. So uh, today's seminar is a bit different because now we have both sellers and both buyers. So which position should we take? Should we take? And am I going to take a position 
at all towards the end? We'll see, all right, we'll see. But before we go that, let me just go to the screen with that question in mind. Hope you can see my screen. Yes. Whether you are a buyer uh, or you are a seller, all right, or even if you are realtors like us, professionals in the market, first question I want to ask all of you, all right, is uh, do you personally find it easy to understand the lender market? Do you find it easy to understand the lender market? Uh, if you have your computers or phone with you, maybe you can just do a quick poll inside the chat group and just let us have a few to see whether you understand or not. Just put a yes or no. Okay, good, good. Coming in. Yes, yes, no, no, okay, we can see. Great, thank you for participation. By the way, we have an hour. I try to make it as interactive as possible, not a lot of time, yeah, but uh, let's see how. Good, thank you so much for your comments. Now, generally, let me just tell you from my years of experience in the leather market, even I myself, I find it quite challenging, all right, quite challenging to understand what is this lender market and how uh, uh, the performance of it and how do you even understand what is the value of a, a particular lender property, all right? Do you know why? These are some of the reasons, okay, to understand it. Uh, to make it very difficult to understand, pardon me. First thing is every landed house is very, very different compared to uh, your HDB flats and your condos. Landed property has a lot more qualities that affect the value. We're not talking just about your land size, your build-up area, your number of rooms, which already differs a lot from house to house. But there are a lot of other factors that when you're in the market, you understand, all right? The facing, the location, who are you facing, the quality of the neighbors, etc. okay? And then uh, when you look at it, and every house is different, frankly, even except for a developer uh, developments where almost every house has a consistent look. Otherwise, almost every landed house is different. Secondly, is a lack of media coverage. I'm not sure if you've been reading newspaper reports over the years. Okay, I can count. I can tell you, I read the papers every day. Uh, every month or so, you'll get reports on uh, a, either HDB, which is uh, widely reported, or you get private property uh, reports. Okay, today one just came out from SRX. And you always realize that there's always a caveat. They always put non-landed. Okay, always non-landed. Uh, for fear, maybe, you know, maybe this is too niche a market, or maybe the volume is too low. Uh, such that the media prefers or actually has a, has a practice of not covering it that much. I, in one year, I can count. Sometimes when I look at a report and it, it mentions landed, I'll be very excited you know, to show it to my clients. All right? Generally, there's a lack of media coverage. So for a lot of clients that we are referring on, uh, relying on media coverage, you realize that, hey, we don't even hear anything about landed market. Is it doing well? Is it doing not well? Et cetera. Okay? Now, the third point is the most important point, which is the lack of data transparency. What do I mean by this? I think uh, all of you here, most of you are homeowners, all right, whether you're staying landed or not. I'm sure all of us have, at one point of time have gone into a URA, all right, URA or HTTP website to check what's the transactions, okay, transactions. You've done so for landed, you realize two things are missing, all right? Besides the land, land size, of course, the date of transaction, uh, the price, and per square feet, you know one main thing that's important that's missing, number one, is the build-up area, okay? You could have two houses that are sold within the same street, let's say I say Coven Road, for example, all right, one is 1,002, one is uh, land size, 1,002 square feet, the other one is, sorry, 1,005 square feet, the other one is 1,005 square feet, but the price can be vastly different. And one of the main reasons could be the build-up area is different, right? You don't even put the number of uh, stories that this house has, not to mention the number of rooms or the build-up area. You can't tell, all right? Of course, one way for us to find out is to let us go and find out where this house is. You can always drive to go and see but you realize in URA, even the house number is not stated. So sometimes when you look at the URA data, you get even more confused. You get more, more confused, especially in the road. If you don't later after this, you can try. All right, find out if you're staying in landed property now, go and check. What is the variance or the, 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 the difference all right, within the street that you're staying at? Okay, so with this, with this uh, mystery, okay, I call this mystery surrounding a lot of landed properties, yet we are still, okay, landed properties are still the most highly priced and the most exclusive residential asset class in Singapore, right? But does this mean that therefore we should be denied uh, transparency? I hope not, okay? But so what my team and I have been doing, uh, because for us to be able to advise our clients, I think it's important for us to understand the market. So we have been actually publishing a reports like this. We do this on a quarterly basis, 
right, quarterly basis because uh, if you go by every month, the number of transactions may not be meaningful enough for us to derive any trends. We'll be doing this for the last uh, couple of years. And the last is this red one. I don't know whether you can see my cursor. Is the red one that's on quarter one. I think a lot of our clients here today, uh, thank you very much for joining us, I think have received this report from us. Uh, but I want to share with you that today's uh, coverage will be a lot more than that. All right, will be a lot more than that. By the way, you want any of these reports in the past, you can go to any of the Hartman Savings. Okay. So that which brings us to today. We have 60 minutes or less. I have, not to scare you, about 50 slides. So I have to go about one minute per slide. But uh, trust me, the things are quite self-explanatory. So you just uh, take a look. And if there's any questions, you can always put down. All right. I'm going to break this up into three parts. Three different parts. Because for us to understand the market, I think it's too fast for us to say, let's just dive in now and take a look at April data. All right, I'll take a look at 2020 data. So I'm gonna first spend some time to cover the first part. And uh, I've chosen the last 20 years. All right, last 20 years to just let us have a look at last two decades, a, a comprehensive overview on how the market is. A part two, which is what all of you are here for, is on impact of uh, COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 so far, all right? And uh, last but not least will be interesting, will be uh, let's take a look at what the future holds for us. Okay, let's take a look, last 20 years. Uh, Any one of you have stayed in your landed property for more than 20 years? Maybe if you have, you can just say yes in the chat group. More than 20 years. I won't be surprised, okay? A lot of our clients have uh, average, I think, stay in the house for about eight to 10 years minimum for landed properties, okay? A lot of the houses we're marketed, uh, we're marketing now have sold before uh, easily more than 20 years, built in the 90s, built in the 80s, okay? So if you are, you should be quite familiar with what's happening in the last two decades, all right? Thank you for the response, quite a lot, good. Okay, so to first, let me go back one slide. Um, one fundamental, right, for us to understand the market on price, it's quite simple. Actually, it's quite simple. It applies to all asset class in Singapore. Price is basically a function of demand over supply, right? Demand and supply. If you understand these two factors well enough, you could more or less understand how the market is going to perform, all right? So uh, let's take a look at the last 20 years and see whether this holds true. So when we talk about demand, okay, demand, a big part of it is actually based on our population. So what I have here is a chart that shows over the last 20 years. The three lines here, first is the total population growth, the blue one, okay? Next, we have our total residents, uh, which is Singapore citizens plus uh, PRs. And last but not least will be Singapore citizen, right? Singapore citizen. I pull out the Singapore citizen part is because majority, till today, majority because of a foreign uh, ownership restriction, majority of uh, owners of landed properties in Singapore are still Singaporeans, okay? So if we're going to take a look at this, let's see what has happened. There will be, by the way, from this slide onwards, quite a lot of numbers. Don't worry about the, the, the numbers per se. I think what we want to see is to capture the overall trend. Okay, so don't be overwhelmed by it. By, over, although I've tried, believe me, I've tried to simplify this as much as I can. So in the last 20 years, okay, total population growth is about 1.8%. Okay, 1.8% of which uh, you can see residents have grown by about 1.1 citizens at 0 0.8. What happens to the missing one, you'll ask, okay? You see the difference between here and here? All right, this is the foreigners, okay? Foreigners in, uh, inclusive of work pass owners, uh, 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 the, the foreign imports and the foreign talents, all right? And the foreign workers, which is a hot topic nowadays. Actually, over the years, I think we've grown by about, now we're about 1.5 million foreign workers, okay? But of course, majority of them will not be able to buy landed property. So let's just focus, I think, on Singaporeans. So citizens is 0.8%, of which, let's take a look at the last two decades. This is where I think the analysis gets a bit more interesting, all right? So let's take a look at the first decade first, at the turn of the century. So just remember here, 1.8%, you can see that the first 10 years, our total population growth faster, relatively faster in the first 10 years, 2.1%, okay? Citizens are more or less the same, is about 0.7%, okay? And uh, the next decade, Closer to us now at the end of, by the way, this is up to 2019, right? Uh, the uh, statistics is up to 2019. So this is surprising to me. I'm not sure about you because we've been complaining that Singaporeans are not reproducing enough and so on and so forth. But uh, citizens actually have in, uh, increased proportionally more in the, the last decade versus the first one. Of course, a lot of this would be due to a lot of uh, foreigners turned uh, awarded citizenship, okay? So this is the first thing you need to take note of. Out of 1.8%, 
citizenship actually citizens actually accounted for less. And second thing is, is actually more stable. Right, bulk of landed property owners they are growing more slowly, but the gap was reduced in the last decade. Right, clear enough. Good job. This is just the first slide. Any more to come? Okay. Next is the supply. We understand demand. Let's take a look at supply. What we have here also over a span of 20 years are four lines, all right? So first we have landed properties, the blue line, the supply, all right? The supply, there's being a supply. This is not a transaction. Huh? This is based on supply that's in the market, absolute numbers. So like so landed properties, we're selling about 70 plus thousand. We have condominiums, we have HDB flats that forms the bulk, all right, about 80%. It has dropped about 70 plus percent. And this is the total number. Again, we're going to take a look at the last 20 years. Okay, population is 1.8%. Total residential units is about 1.9%. Not too bad, right? It's uh, marginally has almost matched the growth in population. So here are a few more numbers. Let's take a look at out here. Landed will be only 0.6, right? 0.6%. Don't worry about the rest of the asset class because the thing I want to point out to you is this. Now for the next last 10 years, First thing you take a look, okay, for first 10 years, actually condo grew by the largest. And if you could remember, all right, at the turn of the century, the first 10 years, we have a lot of uh, HDB shortage issue, right? Not a lot of supply, not a lot of BTOs. And in this year, uh, sorry, the next, uh, last, next decade, you see condos going up more. But what is consistent throughout the two decades is that landed property supply has remained very low. All right, and in fact, we're looking at uh, about 300 plus units, average of 300 plus units per year only, okay? So it's growing slower than other types of residential properties. And it's also marginally slower than the citizen's population growth. Okay, 0 0.5 is about 0 0.6. Just now we saw uh, in terms of population is 0 0.8. So marginally slower. With this, we have supply, we have demand. Where do you think price have hated in the last 20 years? Do you think price have grown or reduced? Maybe you all can put inside the chat group. We have two... Uh, Statistics now, we have a supply, we have demand. Perhaps you can deduce from here, have prices risen or dropped in the last 20 years. Good, see a lot of replies. Increase in general, go up. That's great. Reason, reason, that's good. Even without inflation, right? We have seen that the prices have risen. But let, me, let us take a closer look in terms of how price have actually changed in the last 20 years. Now, this is the important price trend. All right, important price trend. Now I've taken out uh, again, uh, look at lender properties, sorry, HDB flats first, the blue line. We have lender properties here, and then we have condos, all right, in the la uh, last 20 years. All lines generally are right or increasing over the last 20 years, although HDB has seen a decline. But let's take a closer look at uh, the, the statistics, okay? So average in the last 20 years, these are all uh, compounded annualized growth, right? Compounded growth, lender property and condo have gone uh, basically head to head about 4.5%, with HDB flats at about 2.9%. Again, of course, we know a lot of things have happened in the two separate decades, so it might be better, like what we've done before, to uh, take a closer look at what is the, the magnitude of the growth in each of the 10 years. Okay? So here, first 10 years, HDB grown faster, condo is very fast, landed at 4.2. Last 10 years, very interestingly, HDB has slowed down, Right, HDB has slowed down, you can see the graph going down. Condo is about 3.7%, lender is at 4.4%. Even without me bolding this, I think it's very obvious to us that firstly, uh, landed property growth is more stable across two decades, and it has surpassed the other segments in the last 10 years. Okay, it has surpassed the segments in the last years. I hope there's something new to you. All right, so, Next one, let's take a look. Now that you understand the various, uh, the general growth across the three asset class, would you like to know what happened more specifically to landed properties? Because this 20 years is not all smooth sailing, right? Obviously all of us uh, we can remember. Many things have happened in the last 20 years, okay? So let's take a look, especially now we are in the middle of a new crisis or the start of a new crisis, it might be good for us to recollect what has happened and what are some of the learnings we can gather from there, right? So here, this graph is actually the same graph, the price graph, all right? The only difference is, just take note, this one now includes, uh, sorry, excludes strata lender, okay? It includes, uh, excludes strata lender. The previous charts, this one, you can see the, this is about 1,200 plus because this includes strata property, 
right, strata lender, which will generally bring down the overall price. But because uh, strata property uh, lender accounts for like what, less than 5% of total transactions. So, and most of you, uh, most of our transactions now are in uh, real proper lender property. So we've taken that out. So you can see that the, the actual price is higher, 1,003. The point I want to make here is you can take a look. Now I've actually factored in the volume. Okay, green showing growth versus the previous year. The red uh, basically shows a, a decline. Now here, this is very interesting. You can see ups and downs. Okay, the performance are very, very varied in terms of transaction volume over the last 20 years. Again, I want to differentiate. This is not supply. This is not the supply of houses being built. This is the actual number of houses that have been transacted. Okay, so let's take a closer look. So what happened during the previous major disruptions? Let's start with the dot-com bubble. Okay, a lot of us forgotten about it because this is important because in the last 20 years, this is the only one that actually caused the Singapore to go into recession. All right, uh, even SARS data I'm gonna go through, we didn't go, we marginally uh, escaped recession. So then in dot-com bubble, volume dropped by 30%. You can see a big drop, uh, drop, and then value dropped by 13.7. Next is SARS, during the 2003 and four, value dropped by about 10%, volume is about 23%. So by and large, if you compare these two, actually SARS is not, in terms of effect, it's not as uh, detrimental as a dot-com bubble, all right? I think a lot of people are not analyzing between SARS, but I forgot that actually dot-com bubble has caused uh, a greater effect on that. All right, next, we cannot, uh, escape or ignore the global financial crisis. This to me is the most interesting occurrence. And is uh, let me just show you the numbers first, okay? The volume dropped by a whopping 60%. Okay, 60%. And the value actually increased. Okay, value actually increased by 4.2%. The fact that it actually registered not a double digit decline is already amazing. If I were to show you the uh, a condo once, non landed properties has actually dropped, a steep drop in a month, uh, sorry, in a year, okay? There are many uh, theories for that. Not enough reports were stated, but I have uh, enough clients who have lived through the period to tell me, quite interestingly, okay, this is a story told by one of them. Uh, they just tell me, uh, well, okay, one, one, one hypothesis or theory is that a lot of the landed, or landed owners then, in the first 10 years, okay, first 10 years, a lot of the owners are actually business owners, SME bosses and stuff. They were not as badly affected by the GFC. All right, interesting. Interesting but true. They were not as badly affected, right? If you're not in finance, you're doing basically trading, you're doing a kind of a local businesses and stuff. They were not as badly affected. And a lot of them said, okay, I don't get a price, I just hold. And this is relatively short. It's only a one year crisis almost, right? So for a lot of them, uh, they just hold it and they are not as badly affected because the recession affects a lot more employees than the business owners. How true is that? I think if you have new uh, insights on that, please share with me. I'll be interested to know. All right, that's one reason. Second reason is quite funny. All right, the owner say, "No, I don't get the price that I don't sell. I can afford to wait." Why should I sell? Oh no, no, sorry. The second reason is they tell me I just can't find a buyer. They just hold it. All right, they just hold it. They can't find a buyer. They held it, and then before they knew it, the storm has passed. Okay, very, very interesting occurrence here. But what it has shown in the last first ten years is that the resilience of landed property cannot be underestimated. Okay. Now, we come to the uh, last 10 years. And last 10 years, there's only one phenomenon, okay, that has impacted the entire market, not just landed, not just landed, all right? It is uh, eight or not some say nine rounds of cooling measures from February onwards. I happen to, by the way, we just joined the market in 2011 and right smack in that, okay? So uh, what happened then? What happened then? This one you can see, right? First thing you can see is that almost rate throughout the next, uh, the, uh, this decade, Year by year, it just declined. We only saw a bit of recovery in 2015, 16, and 17. That's when a bit of an on-block craze coming in, demand increase, and then when the, the last uh, 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 cooling measure in uh, November, that actually brings uh, this uh, demand or transaction volume back, okay? Back to a new low again, okay? So average in the last about eight, uh, nine years, volume has dropped by average about 11%. 11%. Oh, by the way, before this, why I mentioned this is because prior to this, even landed properties, a lot of people are flipping. Okay, they could buy it, hold it for six months, three months, the minute they, they make 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, they can flip, just like any kinds of uh, properties, except like HDB, all right, or private properties. But from 2013 or 10 onwards, when ABSD was introduced, this market basically just disappeared. Basically just disappeared. All right? So 
Now, what is interesting here, despite the drawn value, you can see here the pattern here. Normally, for any kind of economic situation, if your transaction volume goes up, right, number of transactions goes up, buy right, your price should go up. Now we are seeing, firstly, a very drastic drop, consistent drop, almost 10 to 11% every year. Yet, value has consistently gone up, despite a slight dip here. Okay? So, what has happened? Okay, what has happened? Why have prices become more resilient despite the cooling measures? And this is not just specific to landed properties, but I'm going to give you some examples of why is that more so, okay? Firstly, is less speculation. Okay, you don't have people basically uh, uh, doing uh, uh, flipping, uh, like I mentioned, and because of TDSR, uh, 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 in terms of affordability measures and stuff, a lot of people, they can't buy and speculate and think that they can just hold it and sell it off. We also have seller stamp duty and all this as well, right? Basically, the owners, the holding power has increased, all right, in the last eight to nine years. There's more liquidity because the major thing that happens here, which we have not analyzed, I'm not going to go into details, is the easing of the uh, uh, quantitative, quantitative easing, right? Monetary policies have become relaxed. There's a lot of liquidity into the uh, markets. Uh, interest rates are very low, all-time low, okay? All-time low. So that makes actually affordability of uh, landed properties becoming more accessible to even okay, working class adults. And uh, frankly, the group of buyers uh, that bought landed properties are getting younger and younger. Gone are the days when in the past few decades, you see only expect people in the 50s to buy. Uh, in my last uh, eight to nine years in landed properties, you will be amazed by how many a dual income family, they're just professionals, they're one or two children and decided to upgrade, okay? So it becomes a lot more affordable. There's a surge in also the condo supply increase. Uh, that in, uh, sorry, condo supply that increase the exclusivity of demand. Don't forget, as you see, we can see condo sprouting up everywhere, right? A lot more has increased, which makes actually in the past maybe condo, uh, uh, owning a condo, even a penthouse, for example, it could be the epitome of, let's say, a status, okay, of luxury, so to speak. But as more and more comes into the market, a lot of them will feel that, no, I don't think it's exclusive enough and I would like to move to a landed property, which by and large, the supplies remain relatively constant as we've seen before. Okay, there's also, we have seen a lot of uh, increased demand from on block uh, recipients. Okay, I could tell you so many stories in these three years. Uh, basically, it's, it's quite madness, all right? Quite madness in the sense, well, it's good madness. You see really, uh, let's say, for example, there are, there are condo on blocks at Amber Road, for example, okay? In that two years, there's so many people just rushing into, because they get average of like, what, four point something million. You can easily buy a SMD, all right? You can easily buy a SMD with cash, cohort, cohort, uh, cohort cash so to speak. So the supply has gone up a lot. Because one of the reasons is that for a lot of on-block uh, recipients, they are used to staying in big properties, 1,005, 1,008 square feet. So when they receive the money and they try to find a replacement property, it is very difficult. All right? right now, frankly, even to today, you want to find a decent size 1,005 or above 2,000 square feet property uh, condo is very difficult. So for them to not have to sacrifice their quality of lifestyle, and plus, of course, the huge payout that they get, uh, a lot of them decided to upgrade okay, to land it. Uh, so this, this as well, we see a trend okay, of the perception of space being the ultimate quality of life. Right? I know a lot of you here, if, especially non landed owners, you may find, oh no, how about facilities and everything, right? But generally, we see a lot. Really now, everybody wants to have their own room for each child. You want to have your own bathroom. You know, uh, a master bedroom must be you know, the size of a three, four room flat example. Okay? Whether you need a space or not is secondary, but a lot of people will think uh, one actually space as a status symbol, especially when condos are getting smaller generally. Okay. So, do we say here the point I want to make here is, is despite you can see that prices have become more resilient despite, or can we say it is actually a result of cooling measures and uh, therefore the price become more resilient? Okay, food for thought. Food for thought. Huh? We'll come back to this in a while. What is very interesting now is the last eight to nine years, because it is so consistent in terms of uh, value uh, increase and also in terms of the performance wise, it is quite predictable. All right, I call this the new norm, right? Is this the new norm? All right, but is this a new suppressed norm? Meaning, oops, pardon me. Suppressed because of the eight rounds of cooling measures. Bear in mind, the price and the value continues to increase even though there's cooling measures. Can you imagine there's no ABSD, TDSR? I think the price will skyrocket. Okay? 
So clear so far in the, last uh, the, the past 20 years, I hope that gives you a very good overview. But now let's take a look. Now really you've told me about last 20 years, what about now? Okay, what happened in 2020, in the last four months of which three months has been exposed to COVID-19? So here, this part, this segment, we're gonna dive in and take a look in the last four months, all right, what has happened. Again, similar chart. Again, this is, uh, by the way, for uh, includes, a, uh, uh, sorry, excludes strata title wise, all right? So here we're gonna take a look at this one from between March to April. Now, one point to take note, because every month the transaction volume is actually quite low. So I, if I were you, don't dwell too much into the numbers because uh, uh, for, for this slide at least, okay? I'm just gonna show you first. Don't worry too much because basically the transaction volume is very low. Okay, so value is here. So and, and April is 1433. What you need to understand or know is that this is the second highest value ever. I repeat, it's the second highest value ever to cross the 1,400 mark. In fact, the only other ones is behind September 2018. There's about 148 something, right? Close to 1,005. But that is because in this month, there is a big launch, all right? There's a big launch of um, Luxus Hill, all which are close to 1,900 plus per square feet, okay? That brought up. Uh, the value, okay? This is the highest month ever. So you think that the prices are dropping, let me just remind you, okay? So, a, in, if you were to compare this four months, okay, in 2020 versus average of last year, this will be a more meaningful uh, comparison, okay? So the average of 2020 versus last year, the whole year has actually, or first four months has actually increased by 2.4%, okay, 2.4%. Uh, at this point, I was just wondering, you might have read reports uh, on lender property. I think a few weeks back, they mentioned so the first quarter, that's only by first quarter, does not include April, because April actually went up, right? That shows actually a negative value. Uh, both values are correct, but they use different indices. Here, we are looking at average per square feet, whereas some other uh, reports actually measures the median price, right? The median price. Both are different indices. Okay, both are in, in different ind indices. It doesn't matter which one you choose, but as long as your base is the same, right? Okay, let's take a look at volume now. So volume, let's take a look here. This is April. Is this surprising to you? Well, it is surprising to me in some way. Let me explain why, okay? So in April, uh, transaction about 57 units. On a, on a good year, by the way, right? On a good year, every uh, month is about 100 plus. Right, so every, for the last few years, it's about 1,005 a year. Every month is about 100 plus. So in April, when there is a lockdown, right, I'm, I'm surprised firstly, despite the lockdown, there's still 57. I expected less. Okay, what's not surprising is that uh, there's still some resilience in terms of the demand, minus 49%. And what does this mean? This is the lowest April record ever. One thing to take note of is for transaction uh, value, there's actually seasonality. All right, seasonality. So every month, for example, quarter two is traditionally uh, much higher compared to quarter one, okay, and quarter four. And uh, some of this, by the way, could have been brought over. One of the 57 units sold here uh, was actually sold by my team, okay, but it's uh, sold in March, but transacted in uh, recorded in, uh, in April, okay. Uh, one point to take note now, some of you have the same uh, index. If you go to URA now, you actually see 60 units instead of 57. Just think, no, this, my data is from last weekend because the numbers were run, okay? So in the last few days, some who has been soaked, then they just record it. So there's now actual numbers about 60, just to let you know. Okay, let's move really faster. How about, uh, let's take a look at the volumes by house types. Again, let's not be too concerned about this. So just to show you the trends, basically everything has dropped, uh, semi-D, detached, and terrace. I'll go a bit faster, but don't worry, this is not very uh, influential on the things that we're gonna discuss, okay? So again, this is April. A terrace has gone up, detached, semi-D, etc. Okay, clear so far. You can just take a second load in. You can snapshot if you need to. There are not many transactions of 57, so don't worry too much about the movement. Normally, we'll just look at it by uh, a collection or a, big, a, a longer period, so to speak. Okay, what is interesting here? I think uh, all of you, maybe you can now put in and let us, let me know, where do you stay? <laughs> District, okay, maybe you can just share with me, all right? Are you staying in central region, east region, or northeast region? Are you in the central, east, and northeast region? As you type in the poll, I'm just going to share with you. Uh, I'm going to, for the, this one, as we dwell in a bit deeper, okay, we're going to cover actually these 10 districts. 
These 10 districts are chosen because they represent the three, not just because they're clustered together, but they represent about 80% of total lender transactions in Singapore. Okay, of course, we have also the outskirts as well, but the volume is not big enough for us to dwell too deep inside. Not to mention, that, not to say that they're not important, okay? I'll go a bit faster from here. So, uh, keys for you to know, Fan. Now, this is central region. Central region, you have District 10, Bukit Timah, uh, and a bit of uh, basically 10, 11, Bukit Timah, Danian side. Sorry, let me just go back one slide. Okay, this is central region. 10, 11, 21, and a bit of Upper Bukit Timah. Okay, East region will be 13, 14, 15, 16, basically from Epherson all the way to Upper East Coast. And then you have the Northeast region of uh, uh, Serangoon, uh, Thompson, as well as Salita. Okay, so from here, the trend, what you've seen here is District 10, minus 30, uh, 11 plus 1.4, and uh, District 21 is minus 13. Again, this is just one month. Don't dwell too much into it will be more interesting to look at this chart, okay? This chart, where if you take a look at the first four months versus last year, District 10, uh, remember we have gone by total market, uh, I remind you again, it's plus 2.4%, okay? Plus 2.4%, so let's just benchmark. So you have District 11 doing slightly better, but District 10 has gone down, District 21 more or less also has gone down as well, slightly less than that. There are many reasons on this, but uh, today we don't have time uh, to draw into the individual transactions. But uh, we have time later. You can put inside the question later. If I have time, I can clarify with you. Okay. Uh, what is interesting is District 11, by the way, this is the second highest, uh, second highest ever uh, behind 2013. This was the peak. So now we are at 1839 per square feet. A lot of people think District 10 is more expensive than 11. Actually, 11 is more expensive significantly. Okay. So next is uh, East Region. All right, go a bit faster. This is East Region. There are more districts here. So again, April, not to worry. You can snapshot, take a phone, because just April. Some don't even have a transaction. I can see it is reporting. So let's take a look at this slide, right? This is a bit more interesting. East side generally, okay, is doing a bit better. You see a lot more positive. Even District 16 is almost flat, okay? 14, 15 has generally done better. 14 is because there's a lot of new uh, launches that are being sold. 15 traditionally has been popular, and uh, we have MRT lines all this coming up. Again, I would dwell into each district if you want to, but uh, today we don't have the time, so it's just for you to have a feel, okay, uh, of, uh, of the major regions. Next is Northeast region. Okay, North, Northeast region, we see a quite a lot more movement. Pardon me, I should let you see this slide first. Again, this is April, don't worry too much. Let's take a look at this year versus last year. Okay, 19 is quite flat, right? 19 is quite flat. But what is important is that 19 at 1, 2, 5, 9, this is the highest record ever. Okay, I could go on about why 19, by the way, I say 19. Uh, but one main reason is that there's a lot of upgraders. Okay, there's a lot of upgraders from the condo owners here. They're buying their first from their four bedroom condos. They want to move to their first lender. Okay, so movement here, by the way, this is in terms of transaction volume, it's also the highest for the street 19. Okay, 20 has uh, dropped by 4.2. Not that the prices are not holding up, but because a lot of the houses sold are actually larger. Okay, larger, so the PSF is lower. And then we have District 28. This is basically, a, I think, the champion, I think, among all the districts because of uh, Luxus Hill and a few other new launches. All right. This is also the highest record ever at 1,005. You'll be surprised. All right. At District 28, people always see it's at Salita and things like that, but this is the highest record ever. If you're staying in 28, uh, I hope you're happy. Or you're buying 28, don't be upset. <laughs> okay, next. So we finished the first two parts. I have about 20 minutes. Let's take a look at the future outlook. Okay, a future outlook. Now, this is going to get a bit sensitive, right? Because remember, we have the Mr. Big and the Mr. So. I don't know who are the Mr. Bigs and Mr. So's here, okay? Regardless, whether you are buying or selling, whether you are buying or selling, I'm not here to tell you whether you should buy or you should sell. But let's take a look, okay, in terms of the, uh, understand how the current market is now objectively. Because what is very, we're all humans, like I mentioned, it's easy for us to listen what we want to listen, okay? If you are a seller, Oh no, if you're a buyer, you only listen to the bad news. You just want to make sure that things just go crash, uh, you know, the market will just crash and things like that and not have a balanced view. Same for sellers. Same for sellers as well, who might be in denial of uh, the current situation, thinking that COVID-19 will not affect the landed market, especially what I've shown you in the last 20 years. Okay, so let's take a more balanced approach. I'm not going to take any position, or maybe I would towards the end, but let's take a look. And we might, towards the end of this 20 minutes, maybe we can come to a conclusion together. Okay. Let's take a look. Okay, caveat, I don't have the crystal ball. Frankly, if I know what's going to happen, I know this is the most popular question now. Can you please tell me so and so? So and so can you please tell me what's going to happen. Frankly, I don't think anybody can predict what is going to happen 
in the near future, in the short term, uh, two to three years, for example. All right, there's so many reports going around. But let's take a very balanced approach and see what uh, is happening right now, okay, before we form our own conclusion. Okay. There's a disclaimer slide, by the way, we didn't play it, but as I said, uh, please don't hold me to it, <laughs> whatever decisions you make. But let's take a look, okay, it should be quite sound. Now, first question, what do we already know? Okay, what do we already know? This slide, I'm going to flash the fastest because you have enough of this uh, news, okay? Economy is basically in deep shape, uh, deep, uh, bad shape, sorry. Bigger trouble than many realize, long recovery, so and so forth. Worst recession, okay, this has come out. We have not seen this in the last 20 years, probably, even JFS, maybe JFC, yeah, but we have not seen this new, at least in this decade, right? Not just recession, but the worst re uh, recession. The sources are all here. I hope you are not uh, unfamiliar to all these uh, reports. But that's, that's, does this mean the end of the road? Let's just see, okay? Let's not forget, we have a, quite a nimble government here. All right, the fact that we have eight rounds of uh, cooling measures, you know the government reacts pretty fast. All right, so these are some of the things that the government has already done. Uh, uh, allow people to defer their home loans to the end of the year so that people who, let's say, lose their job, have their uh, pay frozen, you don't need to pay off your mortgage for until the rest of the year, okay? There are some temporary relief and uh, job saving measures as well to minimize uh, or to reduce the, the drop in uh, a retrenchment. Okay, I'm not gonna go to the details but the sources are here. You need all these details, you can always research it online, all right? Just to give you a feel of what the government is doing. Now, this is quite important, okay? This is quite important because right now, we are not going to let, basically, the market go into free fall, okay? Besides the $60 billion that the, the, the government has, has put in, I think the government is committed to minimize the impact uh, of COVID-19, okay? So with this, we know. Look at this headline. I love this headline, okay? Singapore private home prices is set to tumble, all right? I agree. Come on, we have the worst crisis uh, ever. And frankly, this is global. It is not just economic. It's not just financial. It's going to affect a lot of people. We will be denying, uh, uh, in denial, if you're going to say that, no, I think you know, we're going to escape unscathed, uh, in, at least in the short term. Question is by how much? This report actually states something that I mentioned briefly earlier. Okay. A fair correction is expected, not to the magnitude of the plunge over the four quarters. Uh, during the global financial crisis. Why? Okay, because then there's a lot of rampant speculation, there's a lot of loose credit, and this has mentioned, uh, supported what I wanted to say earlier, the nine rounds of cooling measures have really, really controlled, okay, the amount of speculation to almost zero. I think people in the market, real estate agents, they will tell you, who dares to speculate on, I wouldn't say five million property, or three million, let's just buy for fun and see how it goes. If you cannot afford it, let's just buy, let's stretch our income and buy a three million uh, uh, in the terrace. No. It is, or at least from what I've seen, okay, we don't see this kind of uh, unsound and uh, 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 illogical uh, behavior behaving in the market, okay? So this time around, I think the government has extended to save jobs, okay, elevate cash flow. This will reduce, uh, reduce distress and fire sales in the near term. Uh, remember what the Mr. Uh, Mr. Bay asked me, is that fire sale? We have a lot, uh, by the way, this is, this is one of the hottest topics among buyers now. Really, you have a fire sale in Serangoon Gardens, in East Coast, you know, uh, price 1,000 uh, 1, now, 800, a lot. Okay, we have a lot. Sorry to disappoint you if you belong to this group, okay? And I'm so glad this report came up. Uh, it basically states that there's a lot more mortgage listings, which is true. By the way, we've seen this uh, over the last two, three years. I myself have lost sellers who say, mm, I, after selling for three months, I can't get my price. I'm going to go to a... Uh, auction, okay, and I can tell you nine out of ten times they will come back disappointed. All right, right now there's no distress sales. I can say no, no per se, but generally we have not seen it yet. I'm looking for myself. I mean, not for myself, for my clients and stuff. But frankly, sellers are not that much in a hurry. Okay, sellers they also don't need to. They can just pull out if the market does not favor them. Same thing is here as well. The three packages as mentioned. Homeowners they are not so anxious. Okay, they just wait. Well, you can't pay if you still have some certain uh, your, uh, your income and things like that. I just don't pay the mortgage and wait till uh, end of the year. Not forgetting, by the way, income as uh, this interest rate has also uh, reduced. We have actually a good proportion of our clients who took this opportunity in the last two months to refinance, okay, and uh, to enjoy a lower mortgage rate. With this, what does the future hold?
Some of you are asking, what do you think, what do you think? But let's take a look, okay? To analyze the future, uh, quite simple. Let's go back to the basics, go back to the fundamentals. We don't need to be an economist or a strategist for us to make simple deductions, all right? Quite simple, and I was say simple, logical deductions. We have understood easily, again, price is a function of demand and supply, all right? Without looking at all other factors, okay, that may or may not affect. Let's just look at what may happen first in future. Let's take a look at the impact of each of these occurrence on demand and supply and resultant uh, impact on price. Okay, so the first one, we know this, right? There's going to be a sharp market depression. This year, you would ask me, things are going to be rosy by the end of the year. I can tell you no, right? In terms of recession, and even after CB is open, uh, circuit breaker is open, I think the market still takes time for everything to revert back to normal. So do we expect a drop? a sharp drop, but potentially less severe than before? Yes, all right? Will this reduce the demand? Yes. What's the impact of this? It reduce, there's a downward pressure on price, all right? Here, by the way, this is downward pressure, does not necessarily mean price will drop, although it may lead to that, but because here we're gonna compare uh, various uh, factors together. Okay, next, this one is a bit more intuitive, it's a bit more insightful. Uh, this is uh, gathered from experiences on ground. I myself, I deal with a lot of uh, uh, buyers and sellers. Every week I'm out there meeting them. And uh, through that, I actually have a pretty good understanding, all right, on uh, why are people buying, why are people selling. One of this is a, pardon me, before this, I think I jump to the next uh, point. Here, what I'm trying to say is there's a change in lifestyle. With uh, CB now, I don't know about you, the fact that I'm now right here sitting here, to present this in uh, online uh, format, this is basically a sign of things to come. A lot of things will be done more home-based, all right? More home-based, people will be less uh, encouraged to go out, okay? We have reports like this that mentioned working from home will be a norm. There's also a, a move towards a decentralized CBD, all right? So some comments here, CEOs have said working from home could be a permanent, could be a permanent or viable strategy for certain uh, um, uh, industries, okay? So what does this mean? If more people stay at home, do you not think that they will place an emphasis of space? What do you think, all right? I personally think this will increase the demand, right? The demand for more quality space, whether quality means you have quantity or not, but generally, if more people are gonna stay at home, because through my, let me see, 40 days of experience, really quite interesting. I think the most comfortable group of uh, clients I met over the phone and stuff uh, through discussion is the lender clients. They say, oh, okay, no, I don't feel very cramped. I have so much space around. Finally, I get to use my study. Finally, I get to use my fourth floor, you know, rather than condo people, they have to squeeze with the home-based learning and things like that, all right? So with this, I've also have some clients in uh, condo HTV thinking that, no, I think my house is too small. I need to, up uh, I need to uh, upgrade, okay? With this, this may cost a decent demand and price uh, the upward pressure on price. Okay, again, we're not concluding now. Let's take a look. Uh, one thing that we know already is that limited land and very new developments. Okay, unlike condo launches that comes out in hundreds, if not thousands of units, please tell me or name me one recent landed launch that's big. You can name, all right? You can really name. You can remember, there's Luxus Hill. There's one now by Fais in the west side. That's it, all right? A few uh, developments. They are not uh, very big ones, so to speak, okay? If the refresh you, this is basically Singapore map. The red parts are landed property zones, okay, landed zones in Singapore. You don't need to look at the projecting the future. You just need to know in the last 10, 20, 30 years, has Phuket Timah increased in size? Has East Coast increased or Siglap Estate increased, expanded and pushed out to the beach? No, all right? Have you seen Coven uh, or Salita or Serang Gardens expanding beyond that and taking up space from the condos or the HDB? No. Has government actually given GRS, okay, government land sales to landed very rarely, all right? So what we do know is that supply is going to be very constant. Were the red dots within the red dot, I call this the red dots within the red dot, would it ever expand or increase in future? Very straightforward answer, all right? Quite unlikely. We have, as I said, 300 plus units and a lot, by the way, the way that uh, supply has increased over the last 10, 20 years is through subdivision. A lot of the big houses were subdivided from a, a, a Bungalows to two semi-Ds, uh, from big bungalows to uh, three houses, for example, okay? The true expansion or true allocation of land to land that has not really increased in the last 20 years, and it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna increase in the foreseeable future, all right? 
So, okay, on this note, I just want to, you look at this map, all right? What is the country that makes you think, uh, uh, you think is the closest to, in, by comparison? I, I've kind of cheated a bit and show you the next slide. Let's just jump to this, okay? We all know, I use Hong Kong. I always says like to use Hong Kong economies, uh, 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 people in real estate always like to, because really we are like basically uh, uh, siblings in terms of similarity, in terms of a lot of factors, okay? So before we go there, let's just take a look first, okay? What has happened to Hong Kong in the recent years? This came out just 5th of May, very recent. This is the worst uh, uh, contraction that the Hong Kong economy has seen since 1974. I hoped the same headline won't be changed to Singapore. But uh, based on what I've seen probably, right? Because I think if you've seen the last 20 years, one point something, if you're gonna hit four, five percent, it will be the worst, okay? What do you think happened to the land price there? Okay, worst seen over for Hong Kong home prices. This is from Business Times just last week, right? And what are the factors that cause a, a Hong Kong home prices to not just be resilient, but to actually bounce back, all right? Let's understand some of the fundamentals both Singapore and Hong Kong, we have a shortage of land, right? Short, severe shortage of land. We are a very small country, and frankly, to have, what, three, 4,000 square feet of land when uh, uh, in a very land scarce space like Singapore is a luxury. Can the government afford to give more land uh, to landed properties and to house basically a fraction of the number of people staying there? I don't think so. We all know the population um, uh, uh, target, right? Growth target for, for, for Singapore, and that's just gonna cause a lot more density. So, and they also mentioned about low borrowing costs. Is that similar to Singapore? Yes, okay. So this is basically, they put a, a floor, which is basically the basic, the, the, the really the bare minimum on, on which the price can be sustained, all right? And this is, uh, I personally find this quite op optimistic, but uh, they say it actually can rise by as much as 10%. Can you imagine they just had the worst economic contraction, and yet in the next six months, they project this to grow, okay? I would like to say a lot of this demand will come from uh, China per se, no doubt. But of course, uh, we also have seen reports saying that uh, uh, Chinese buyers have also started to string in or shun away from Hong Kong, right? So this could be just domestic, plus of course the China demand as well. Okay, so what does this mean? Supply will continue to be low. Would this uh, have upward pressure on price? Right, okay, quite straightforward. All right, uh, five minutes, I'll go really faster. Okay, so exclusivity will increase as condo apartment supply continue to rise. All right, we, we have really, I mentioned this before. So this is relative to landed, okay, relative to landed. And I really see a lot of my clients now, they are actually up condo upgraders, buying their first landed, right? Buying their first landed. If they say, like say, okay, I get a four bedroom now, it's gonna be 2 million, 2.2 million. Why don't I just buy a landed at 2.5 million? Right, I get five bedrooms or I get four bedrooms, but at least I get land, for, for instance. Okay, and you generally get, besides the land, a thousand six square feet, uh, let's say terrace, for example, you may get 2,005, 2,005 square feet of build up space versus let's say for the same price of a two million uh, condo, maybe less, less than 1,005, for instance. Okay, I see a lot, a lot of uh, increase uh, of this group of upgraders. Okay, so demand will continue to increase and this will have a upward pressure on price. Next, okay, disparity with household income. Uh, to understand this, let me show you a very interesting chart, okay? This one is on, uh, okay, firstly, the lines. The lines are the average transaction value, okay? This is different from the PSF, huh? this is different from PSF. So this one is actually the average transaction value of a property. So for instance, in uh, 2019, okay, you'll be interested to know the average transacted uh, uh, price of a terrace house is 3.9 million. Okay, 3.9 million average. Uh, for a condo, it's about 1.5557, and HDB is 432,000. Okay, that's how you read the charts, okay, on this tree, lah. All right, the average price. So this is landed, you have condos, and here. Of course, you can see condos going up and down. But that's not the point I want to make. Okay, sorry, also the, the yellow ones are the household income. Okay, household income. Let's take a look at how household income and this uh, average price have grown. What is the impact on this too? It's about affordability, right? The point I want to make is about affordability. If you have an income versus a the average price, if you owe, uh, uh, earn more relatively, more than let's say the average price, your affordability will increase. Let's take a look at the first 10 years first, okay? So average growth for household income is about 2.4%, okay? 2.4%, you look at the increase in price, 
all right, 4%, 5%, 5.5, uh, 5 plus percent, okay, the first 10 years, okay? Basically, your income has not risen as much as property value, okay? But uh, you can say, well, this is a bit more normal. Remember, the supply, demand is a bit more balanced. This is where it gets a lot more interesting. Let's take a look, okay? The last 10 years, income has increased still relatively more at 3.6% versus 2.4, almost a 50% increase, all right, in terms of percentage points. Right, but you see HDB price going down, uh, not going down, but growing slower. Uh, you see condo price not growing as fast and landed also not going as fast. Okay, also not going as fast. All right, so the first thing you can see here is there's a big disparity from here onwards is actually the reverse. First 10 years, you have income growing slower than the property price. The last 10 years, you have actually seen income growing faster. Remember, there's a lot of liquidity and everything going, right? Growing actually faster than the price of properties. If you understand, uh, impact of uh, uh, the cooling measures, uh, uh, all this uh, liquidity, uh, sorry, control measures and stuff like that, you understand, okay? So growth in average income has actually outpaced growth in all residential properties in the last decade. What does this mean? Have houses become more affordable on the whole? Okay. So you see here, disparity may be reduced, all right? May be reduced. So in the sense that the property price here, because there's a big gap, that means there's still a lot of liquidity around. Singaporeans generally still can afford higher value ones, but because of all the measures that's come in, they can't, all right? They are restricted because of that, all right? So the demand may increase, which will lead to upward pressure on price, okay? Now, uh, this point is basically ABSD and construction, uh, ABSD, unless ABSD is relief. I can tell you now, ABSD is a big pain okay, for landed property owners and I, I really feel the pain for them because they are frankly, the, the ABSD is always targeted at what, speculators, right, buying a second property and third. But I can tell you ABSD has, has, uh, has cast a very uh, uh, negative light and, and on all this I call it innocent, innocent parties because I can tell you in the past before ABSD when I sell houses, most of the time, all right, I get an empty house. They would buy a house first, what well, they can afford. Of course, they do bridging loans and stuff. They'll buy a house, uh, renovate, then the whole family will move in, you know? So that when I sell the house, the house is vacant a lot of times. Now, because it makes things easier because they, they, they need time to renovate, maybe six months, three months, and so, you know, they buy first, do a bridging loan, and then they slowly move over. Otherwise, can you imagine the whole family, five, seven people who have stayed there for 30 years, 20 years? Uh, now, and this is what, 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 what's happening now. If you're an upgrader from terrace to a semi-D, you have to buy, you cannot buy first. You have to sell your houses. And when you sell, you may not be able to find the house that you want to buy. When you find a house that you like to buy, you may not be able to sell off your house in time. So this ABSD, because why is it more important for lender? Because lender, the quantum is a lot higher. It's a lot higher. I'll give you an example. If you're going to buy a 5 million property, 3 million to 5 million, the ABSD for the poor uh, terrace owner, 3 million to buy, uh, buy 5 million. Imagine it goes through the same strategy. She has to pay 12%. All right, you have to pay about 600,000 to the government, right? Just for ABS, although you can get it back, but 600,000, can you imagine how much cash and how much things you can do with that, okay? Unless that has, is relieved and construction costs, by the way, is also another, we all know it's going up, so I'm gonna go through on this. Uh, preference for renovated and uh, brand new house will continue to rise because this is the trend we've seen over the years. People are willing to pay higher price, higher PSM or newer house, newer house or even brand new house. We know they are more costly, especially the new ones. We know just like condos. Okay, the price disparity is a lot. Okay, 40-50% in terms of PSF. You can use to buy a, maybe an inter-terrace, maybe 2.2 million and then you rebuild it, for example. Now you may buy a brand new one, three point something. Okay, but some people are still going to this because they just can't afford to pay the ABSD uh, for, for old house. Imagine you have to buy old house, you have to uh, take six to nine months. You don't have the time. Your six months will be gone. Okay, if people go to more renovated or brand new house, the PSF will go up. Okay, the price will go up. Aging population, this is what we know. Uh, I think a lot of people now are moving in together now uh, with their parents more and more to take care of children and everything, all right? And also will increase demand for uh, houses either with lifts or with granny rooms on the first floor, okay? And also generally larger houses as well, all right? So this will also increase the demand and uh, it will increase the price. Upward pressure on the price. Now, well cut, last but not least, this is the cooling measures. I'm helped by going back down. This is the... I feel is the most important, most significant, okay? Uh, but before we go to the understanding of this, okay? So this report came up, cooling measures may expect the property market greater pain. Again, 
it re-emphasize and uh, there's certain statistics, uh, statistics here, which I think is very important for us to know, okay? We all know about the measures, I'm not gonna talk about it, but from here you can see, from the end of 2011, almost nine years, okay? Our economy grew 80%, uh, sorry, 40%, and yet our private, pri uh, private home prices are up just 4.2%. Is there a disparity? Okay, 10 times, huh? 10 times. You don't need to be an economist or, right, to understand there's something wrong here, all right? There's something wrong here. Our net, uh, household net worth is similar to the charts that I showed you just now, grew 70, 20, 50. This is accumulative, huh, by the way, accumulative. Total value only grew by 29%. Do you see a gap? What's happening to all the money? Is it going to banks? Fixed D? Going to stocks? All right? The reason is here. Okay, reason is here. A lot more wealth has generated, household income has increased, affordability has increased, therefore price has continued to increase. And is this the, is this the maximum it can go? I don't think so. All right? This has what caused the downward pressure. Right, the downward pressure. You cannot underestimate this downward pressure uh, over the past many years. And this is very important on how we can have some a kind of uh, or the impact in the future to come. Okay, so but but all right. I put here down because if the government, which so far has uh, claimed not to touch the cooling measures, this will continue to reduce uh, to put a downward pressure of demand and on price and on price. Okay. If you look at this now, you may say, hey, really, there's a lot of green, very little yellow. That's not the point here, all right? That's not the point. The point here is we have not talked about the magnitude. What I want to, hear, to show you here is, by the way, there could be other factors here. Uh, I could come out easily another slide on certain trends that I've seen, all right? But these are the major ones. The main thing here is that the magnitude of this, all you need, for example, this depression, this can be a super big arrow. A super big, instead of 4, 4 to 5%, uh, which is what is widely reported now, if it's a 10% decline, it will change the whole thing, okay? It will change, the, it will overshadow all this little outward pressure that the market is trying to uh, push towards, okay? Cooling measures, if it keeps it, despite what is happening to the economy, cooling measures are still there. It could uh, add an unnecessary downward pressure as well, all right? So with this, am I gonna conclude? What do you think, okay, at this point of time? Okay, with this. Okay, before you go there, let me just tell you for sure, all right? For sure, with certainty, I can tell you what will remain unchanged. Before now, we want to conclude what's going to happen to the market. Pardon me, I'm running a bit over time. This is the uh, last two slides. What will remain unchanged? And instead of giving you a statement, I would like to pose this question to you. First on economic factors, and this to me is the most important. A lot of people, especially buyers, okay, the Mr. Bakes of the world, uh, are telling me the property market will crash. Okay, like it or not, sometimes I just ask them or ask yourself, do you think the government will allow the market to crash? Especially when we have an economic recession, right? Property market, construction industry accounts for a huge portion of our economy, the stability of our economy. When all things fails, retail, services, all this fails, do you think a stable part of this on the construction and the real estate, do you think the government will allow you to crash? Again, we don't need to be a politician, uh, economist. I think for us to answer this, right? If, for example, market crash by 10, uh, uh, drop by 10%, do you think the government will allow you to crash by another, will not step in, all right? Will not step in. And can the, market, can the government step in? Right, just now one slide we've seen. Thankfully, now we can step in. 10 years ago, the few, uh, last decade, there's a lot of measures that the government got caught off guard. Right? Off cut. There's nothing they can do. Price drop, volume drop, that's it. But now we have a lot more things. Okay? Non-economic factors, things that will remain unchanged. Okay? Is, and this one is my urge, and I would like all of you here, sellers, buyers, please think about this. A uh, landed house or landed property is more a home. Okay? It is a home. Please remember now, look around you. Okay? Whether you're at a study or living, look around you, look at your wife, look at your children. You bought this house because of your family. It is a home. You don't buy a landed property because of investment. You're not going to buy this because oh, you, 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 you appreciate uh, in property. Less so. The word I use here is relatively. All right? Of course, I, I still have investors just buying and then they're renting it out. But generally, a landed house is a home. They buy because of a lot of non-economic factors. It's near your children's school. It's convenient for you to visit your parents. Uh, there's a lot of space for your wife. You have to do the baking. You want to entertain etc, etc, okay? 
this will not change. All right, this will not change. And again, if you talk about timing, all right, timing, a lot of people are asking, okay, property market, you need to time and things like that. I would like to just urge you, timing of a homeowner's needs still outweighs timing of economic performance. I give you an example. If, not my clients now, their mother, okay, grandmother, 70 plus, their legs have given way. They cannot make her climb up to level two anymore. Okay, they have to desperately either uh, buy a house with a lift or buy a house with a granny's room or if they cannot afford it downsize, for example, all right? So do you think they can wait? Let's wait for the economy first because I think the knees can wait. I don't think so, all right? If tomorrow, next year, you're going to uh, uh, enroll your children uh, to your preferred primary school, can you wait? Can you wait for economic crisis to be over? You can't, all right? You can't. So the needs will still outweigh. I'm not saying this out from uh, any kind of hypothesis. This is basically from my years of experience and meeting owners. Nobody will tell me, of course, at the end of the day, when they negotiate, yes, we talk about the price and things like that. When they like a house, they choose a house. It's all these factors. Is it convenient? Uh, does the whole family like it? But I only have to take two to three viewings, you know? You have to satisfy the husband, the wife. Uh, the maid has to come sometimes if the house is nice, whatever, but it's too far away from the main road. Uh, they can find a maid, you know, for example. All these are very important. Is this going to change? No. Okay. And last but not least is many factors, all right? What I mentioned, they are very subjective to individual bias. They will affect the perceived value of each standard house. So don't take a uh, ballpark figure of oh, price just now. That's why the indices I showed you just now, don't read too much into it. Oh, District 11 now, the price has uh, gone down. Or just now, the, you saw it's minus 1.2% uh, uh, for District 21. Therefore, my price, my house should go down by 20. I should buy a house at minus 1.2%. No, because different houses have different perceived value. The, the fact that that house has gone down because maybe it's deeper, if I use a district uh, than one, deeper, further away from Beauty YMRT. The house you can look at is within five minutes walk. Do you think the amount of people looking at it will be more or less than the previous house? No, right? The fact that you like MRT, uh, other people may like the MRT. Some people may not like something that's quiet. You may want to lift. Some people may not want to lift. There are many, many factors. I can go on and on about telling all this. So, so a lot of times my clients tell me, okay, do you, really, do you think this house is worth it? I say, you have to tell me more. You know, you have to tell me more. And frankly, trust me, after selling so many houses, at the end of the day, they must like the house. If they like the house, they can push a bit more. If they really cannot, they will not be looking at the house in the first place, right? If not, then we go to the second or third option. They won't buy a house to stay in because it's cheap, okay? Just because it's cheap. But if you can, you're lucky you don't have a wife to, <laughs> to ask and you make the decision good, okay? But most of my experience, are, uh, you, you may find it cheap, sorry, if I'm, I'm, I'm stereotyping husband, will be very happy financially, but the wife say, no, this is too far for the market. You're my children, I'm going to fetch the children. Uh, I'm not going to stay in this house, you know, at the end of the day, all right? So, uh, examples, okay? You look at these houses. Every house is different. Every house, these are some of the houses that uh, uh, my team and I are marketing. Every house is different. You cannot use a line chart. You cannot use certain things and say, there's a certain house uh, that you like. By the way, if you like a certain house, you cannot also time, okay, I like this a lot. Everybody likes it, but let's wait. Let's wait for the economy uh, to, re to improve, okay? One year down the road, for example. Even though you can wait, for example. But this house may be gone, right? This house may be gone. So this is to just highlight to you the subjective because I've seen so many cases, okay? My buyers, they come, they like it, but they wait. They say, oh, I think a better one will come along. Okay, and a lot of, uh, I'm sorry if some of you are invited here, then they go for the second or the third choice because they think a better house will come along. All right? So, does that help us uh, to become better? Oh, sorry. In uh, understanding the crystal ball? Notice I have not given a conclusive answer. <laughs> All right, so now, my most important question, this is really, I think, my second last slide, okay? Most important question, pardon me if you have to stay for a while. Uh, if you can't, you can't. Uh, if you can't, just stay on to the end so we can have an interesting activity together. Right? Most important question, which will, I think, give us a certain hint. Because I want all of us now, don't forget, all of us, we are landed uh, 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 stakeholders. If you're staying in one now, you're going to buy one now. We all have a part to play. Okay? We all have a part to play. Our decision today, our decision six months later, is going to influence the market. Okay? What do I mean by that? The question I want to ask you now is how do you want to influence the future? Okay? You look at this, we've seen the last uh, 20 years. Of course, everybody is now thinking or asking, what's going to happen next? So I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Do you want the price to go up? 
the word is I ask you, uh, one, do you want it to go up? All right? Do you want it to come down? Okay? Uh, but we just get ready. We're going to start a poll soon. But before you answer, I just want to emphasize, even if you are a Mr. Big, okay? Even if you have a Mr. Big, you are a buyer. Yes, you get a good buy, 5 7% below the, uh, the, let's say, at this point, okay? We are all in this together. If you get, uh, let's say, 7% uh, below market uh, valuation or whatever, do you think the next house is going to be cheaper or more expensive? Do you think this will cause a spiral effect? Will you be happy to, let's say, you know, you buy at this point, okay? Can you see my cursor? I hope you can, okay? Minus 7%. And then one year later or six months later, it goes down and down and down. It affects, don't forget, uh, the, the volume is actually quite low. Uh, certain transactions, certain districts, one month, there's no transaction or two, three, four. Your that particular transaction will affect the value of the next transaction. So I ask you, yeah, you may get a good buy, but in the long run, do you want the value of your property? Do your neighbors want the value of the property to go down? Do you want the overall lender property market to go down? Okay, do we really want this? Do you think what, do you, do you know what are the consequences of this? Generally, uh, as both a seller as a buyer, and, and, and a buyer, right? Generally. Because I think COVID-19, if there's anything I've learned, is that I think solidarity, okay, we're in this together. It's not just about economic effects, health effects. I think we all need to pull ourselves together to make sure we go back to normal as much as possible. To come in now to go for good deals, good bargains, yes, it's human nature. I also want to, right? I'm very happy last week when I saw my favorite car. Uh, the Volvo uh, has gone down to way below what, I, you know, like last year. I'm very, I'm very happy, right? Because that's my personal selfish thing. But get yeah, this car prices, nobody cares. I think it's as good as it's cheap. But lender property, do we really want this to go down and stay low for the next 10 years? Do you want an asset, okay, an asset, the most expensive and the biggest com financial complement that we ever own to go down? Or do we want it to progressively in the next 10 years, I'm talking about 8 to 10 years because all of us, uh, uh, as I mentioned, most landed owners stay to 8 to 10 years. Or do you want it to be an upward trend? Okay. And can we afford to have this? All right. I'm not, not saying even there's a recession. If there's a recession now and assuming market doesn't, and everyone just, let's go, you know, and enjoy, throw the horse uh, uh, into the wound and let's crash the market together, for example. All right. Can we afford to do this? You may be happy for a while. We may be happy for a while. Maybe, maybe agents will be happy for a while. We close the deal, get a commission. But generally, if the total property market goes down, is that good for us? That's my last question to you. And uh, Unri, do you have the poll? Or is it out already? So I'll end this with a question, uh, a poll again, which is to answer this question, all right? You just, I think, have to say yes or no or increase. Uh, Bumi, is the poll up? While waiting for the poll, just for a minute, I'm just going to look at some of the Q&A, right? So the poll is, do you prefer landed prices? Touch your heart, huh? don't have to feel pressured. And don't worry whether you're a seller, you're a buyer. Of course, you're a seller, you want to, but also if you're a buyer, especially. Now we have more buyers in this uh, webinar. Okay, you know, I, I'm not against anyone, all right? I'm not siding with anyone. I'm not taking a position. I'm taking a very long-term view and uh, uh, ask yourself in, do, collectively, what do we want us to do? Do we want the market to go up or down, all right? So the poll is going, which is good. Just one minute. And you want to know the results? I, I'm not sure if you can see the results, okay? We have now 73% who said you prefer to go up, okay? 26% you prefer to go down. All right, I respect your wish, but now this 74%, or even the 26%, all of us here, we have a role to play. Okay, we have a role to play. So uh, the answer to how our market is going to go is basically relies on all our hands. Okay, with this, I'll end, I think, my presentation formally, but I will take some time. Sorry, it's about 9.15. If you have 10, 15 minutes, let's, let me go through some of the leading questions, okay? Q&A, okay, quite a number here. Um, uh, wait, uh. I can't see the questions. Give me a second. Right. Uh, thank you, Willie, for the insightful presentation. I'm sure many of us have gained new perspective on you know, the lender property segment. 